Mamie King. I've been in Pueblo since 2010 and have been a social worker, community advocate, yogi, teacher. But tonight, just a person sharing her story. And the answer to the question that comes up so much, what have you been up to? Well, the past few years has actually been pretty difficult. Uh, while my outer world is abundant, incredible boyfriend, great friends, finances, my inner world has brought me to the edge of despair and back more times than I can count. In my desperate search for answers, the dark night of the soul has continued to surface and resonate. The dark night has been described as being shown the places where you've been wounded or shattered, and then healing those parts of yourself. So in a word, healing. Two words, deep healing. And so healing sounds great, kind of romantic, like a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly. Only the caterpillar doesn't transform, it dies. After building its own coffin, cocoon, it seals itself inside and dissolves. And then in a process only vaguely understood by scientists, a metamorphosis occurs and a butterfly emerges. And I realize I've only paid attention to two subjects here, the pretty butterfly and the cute caterpillar, but never the dying caterpillar. The past few years, I've had the opportunity to know the dying caterpillar. And in a community that trans is transforming as much as ours, I imagine I'm not alone. Which brings me to share the insights I now have, only in hindsight from this wild and mysterious road. My life had a breaking point at age 40, six years ago. I had recently quit drinking, was overloaded with work, and knew I couldn't sustain life as it was. So I quit my job and bought a one-way ticket to India. <laughs> 14 months later, I returned. I collapsed. <laughs> dead exhausted. I tried, volunteered, taught, determined not to give in to whatever this was. So I hit it as best I could and ran the same pattern, staying busy. I went through a period I now refer to as rearranging the furniture, doing anything I could on the outside to change the deadness I felt on the inside. Exercise, supplements, books, work, being more social. And then something happened. I fell in love. I downplayed the exhaustion, the dead zone I still felt. Riding the high of new love, I quietly managed, hid it, wished it away. But as anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows, there's only so much room to hide. It became clear that this exhaustion was linked to the energy it took to contain years of unfelt and unexpressed emotion, grief, and trauma, and that the places I was avoiding were the very places where my life force was tied up. And I decided I wanted to heal. Not that I knew what that meant or entailed. Uh, but with the light of my awareness turned inward, it was like something was started and there was no turning back, no road, no map, just be and feel. The despair hit like a brick. I committed to being with what is, feeling the unfelt, holding the unheld, seeing the unseen. All that had been pushed down, cut off, were just too, too much for a young heart to hold. And then I could see it, just the whole setup, spaciousness, no exits, addictions, or places to hide, the awareness to be, and most important, solid support and a loving partner who said, it's okay, I'm not going anywhere, you can fall apart. And fall apart I did, from depths unknown came deep sorrow and heartache, pain, unworthiness, shame, Depression, dissociation, disconnection, tears and more tears repeat. 
I clung to the image of a spiral going inward, feeling one layer at a time, till finally the center could be reached and those evasive core wounds could be touched and freed. And light as powerful as the sun could come shining through. I needed some sort of map or guide or context to help me through. And if right on time, the right healers and teachers appeared, and glimpses, flashes of light, signs and indications that there was another side, and I was coming through, finally. I now have a sense of being through, but that we're never really done. I understand the memes that we silently share, like a secret language that we all know in our hearts but can only begin to find the words. And I see how hard it is to be human, to navigate the inner and the outer, the seen and unseen. Out there in the world, we understandably celebrate all the great outer work being done. And tonight I'd like to honor and acknowledge all the inner work, all those brave in the difficult days and the dark nights. It's not easy to let go of that which has kept us safe and shaped us, all that's locked in our hearts and minds, to surrender outdated beliefs, thoughts, and patterns. But in the end, this is what changes us, our relationships, our community, and our world. Thank you. Crossing the Alps with Carrie Clyde Holly. My title today is metaphorical and just a bit of fun. I'm a Roman historian by trade and a feminist by nature and upbringing. As I was preparing to talk about suffrage for this event, I was struck by a connection I thought would be fun to explore. Hannibal was a Carthaginian general who fought against the Romans in the third century BCE. Carrie Clyde Holly was a Colorado state legislator from Pueblo County among three first women state legislators ever elected in the United States. Yay, Pueblo! Yeah. In 219 BCE, the Romans declared war on the Carthaginians. Hannibal, with the swiftness he became famous for, marched his troops over the Alps, along with his war elephants, and defeated a Roman army in northern Italy in 218. Then in 217, he defeated the Romans again in battle, and in 216, at the Battle of Cannae, he pretty much destroyed the entire Roman army. The Battle of Cannae went so badly for the Romans that afterwards, in order to replenish their legions, they made a deal with their male slaves that if the, these slaves joined the Roman army, they could earn their freedom. As you can imagine, when the war went badly, the economy suffered. Women had to stop wearing jewelry. Here's how it worked. In the year 215, the war was causing so much destruction that it seemed in bad taste for the women to wear their fancy jewels on the streets of Rome. So legislation was passed forbidding to women to wear jewels in public. In the spirit of patriotism, the women accepted this regulation without complaint. For the duration of the war, they stopped wearing their jewels and probably even sold some to help with the war effort. In the year 202, the Romans finally defeated Hannibal and the Carthaginians in the Second Punic War at the Battle of Zama not very far from the city of Carthage. The victory was quite a success for the Romans, but either through neglect or through intention, the male voters of Rome did not repeal the law that forbade women to wear jewels in public. The lex, or law, named after Oppius, its promulgator, was still in effect in 195, seven years after the end of the war. By this time, Rome had recovered in many ways from the fighting, and the women wanted the freedom to wear their jewels again. The women affected by this were elite members of society, mostly the wives of senators, who were all quite wealthy. So they did what women did in ancient Rome when they wanted the government to change a law. They approached their husbands and requested them to take action to get the law repealed. In 195, after repeated attempts failed, the women got fed up and took to the forum. While it was perfectly acceptable for women to try to persuade their husbands and indeed other men to make particular political decisions, Women were meant to remain outside of the public sphere to keep up appearances in this heavily patriarchal society. Their presence in the forum terrified Cato the Elder. Citizens of Rome, he said, if each one of us had set himself to retain the rights and the dignity of a husband over his own wife, we should have less trouble with women as a whole sex. 
As things are, our liberty is now being crushed and trodden underfoot here in the forum. It is because we have not kept our women under control individually that we are now terrorized by them collectively. <laughs> our ancestors refused to allow any woman to transact even private business without a man, but we are now allowing them actually to appear in the forum and to be present at our assemblies? What are they now doing in the streets and on the street corners? Give a free rein to their undisciplined nature and then expect them to set a limit to their own license? What they are longing for is complete liberty, or rather, if we want to speak the truth, complete license. They were warned, they were given an explanation, you know where this is going. Nevertheless, they persisted. And by being willing to step into the public space and demand what was just, they achieved what was just. Chieftain, January, 1878. The female suffrage nuisance is being again stirred up in Denver. Isn't the smallpox enough of a plague throughout the state without the woman nuisance? Oh, Lord, how long? Like women in ancient Rome, women in the last quarter of the 19th century were protesting injustice in this country. As you know, they went beyond the demands of the Roman women because they were tired of having to appeal to the men in their life for justice, and they sought direct representation through suffrage. They wanted their right to vote. To my sister, women of Pueblo, wrote Mrs. Leonora M. Barry Blake on July 6, 1893, you are all cordially invited to attend the meeting which I will address Saturday evening at 8 o'clock at the DeRamer Opera House. All you who are interested in reforms that are agitating the public mind, industrial, social, and political, all who are interested in temperance, suffrage, abolition of child labor, enforcement of education, shorter hours, better wages, and the elevation of the human family, you are invited. Suffrage meetings were held throughout Pueblo, including here at the so-called Colored Baptist Church on 8th Street. And after the suffrage was achieved in 1893, women at this church and at many other sites in Pueblo got together to educate themselves on how to be informed voters and good citizens. In 1894, Mrs. Olin, Gallup, Patterson, Darley, and Smith of the Pueblo Equal Suffrage League wrote to the chieftain, we appeal to the intelligent and conscientious women of Pueblo, to the women who are breadwinners and who courageously stand side by side with their brothers in an unequal struggle for a livelihood. We appeal to the women of leisure and of influence, women in happy homes, to use this power given us towards purifying the political atmosphere in which we live. Not only did women educate themselves, but some women courageously stepped up and ran for office. The Democrats of Pueblo were sure a woman could not win, but the Republicans placed a woman on the ballot and she was elected. Pueblo became the first place in the world, along with Arapahoe County, to elect women to a state legislature. Furthermore, Carrie Clyde Holly of Vineland, our very own county rep, was the first woman to propose a law, argue for it, and see it become the law of the land. She is ours, Pueblo. We ought to shout her name from the rooftops. Hannibal provoked a law which provoked the Ro Roman women to repeal a law. Suffrage achieved in 1893 provoked Carrie Clyde Holly to run for office and promulgate a law. Now it's my turn to provoke you into celebrating women's suffrage over the next 19 months. And please, please, please share your stories of any women struggling for equality. Find us on Facebook. Thank you. I'm Delilah and this is Carrie and we are Divine Real Estate Group with Keller Williams. So um, tonight uh, we decided to put something together so that uh, uh, it can help with the real estate process and hopefully bring some value to everybody in the community. Uh, bring knowledge. And, and Let's begin. So there's so much information out there on the news and on the internet. Um, about home sales, prices, mortgage rates. Um, you want to know what to offer on your dream home so that you're not paying too much or offending the seller with a lowball offer. You also want to correctly price your home at the beginning of the selling process. So let's talk credit. Let's take a look at credit. You have poor credit, low, fair, good, excellent, and most lenders will be asking for a 640 score and above. Although some lenders may be able to work with scores below that guideline. When it comes to lenders, there's four things they're going to be looking for. Um, they're going to look for the capacity, your current future ability um, to make your payments. Um, they're going to look at capital or cash reserves. They're going to look at collateral and your credit. So 
now we're going to take a look at loans. You have uh, a conventional loan. It's any loan that is not insured or guaranteed by a government agency. It has uh, lower interest rates, and most conventional loans require a down payment, at least 5%. Ideally, you want to plan for at least 20% uh, as a down payment. Also, we have FHA loans that are available. Those are federally insured by the Federal Housing Administration. Um, they do require a down payment as low as 3.5%. They tend to have looser guidelines. Um, these loans are a good option for borrowers with less cash um, and a lower credit score. And then you have the VA loans. It's any home loan made by a private lender uh, that is guaranteed by the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. VA loans are a benefit to veterans and offer a great option because they don't require a down payment uh, or um, mortgage insurance. And so now that you're pre-approved, um, you're going to look at properties that market through the MLS. Um, determine which ones you want to take the time to see in person, and then you're going to start narrowing down your search um, to see the home that you see yourself in. So once you go uh, and find the home, the right home, you go under contract, and once you're under contract, you make an offer to the home, the seller accepts your offer, and uh, the process is not necessarily final. While the property is under contract, all contingencies must be met before the sale is finalized. And then you have your fun inspection. Um, they're going to look at the foundation of the property, the lot, the roof, um, the exterior, the attic, um, any interior evidence of leaks, the basement, electrical work, plumbing, appliances, and of course the heating and cooling system. And after inspection, you have the inspection resolution. And uh, with the inspection layer solution, you should contain uh, a list of items that uh, do require attention, that items generally fall into certain categories, like repair, replace, uh, mitigate hazardous conditions, provide uh, some sort of historical background, and then further evaluation. And then insurance, you're gonna wanna shop around and find a good rate on your insurance. Um, don't confuse what you paid for your house with your building costs. Um, buy your home and auto policies from the same insurance company if you can. And um, you want to make your home more disaster resistant if possible. And just seek out other discounts. <coughs> and then <laughs> comes appraisal. So the appraisal, uh, because the appraiser operates independently, his or her opinion will be based purely on the market and the state of the property. But while you may not be able to stay uh, with a final verdict or make a change, certain worthwhile to know that the appraiser uh, will look for. Um, they're gonna look for the size of the property, um, the lot size of, of your home as well are both important considerations. Um, the more bedrooms and bathrooms you have, the more you can expect the house to be worth. Um, the square footage is going to come into play, certainly. Um, it's a large portion that goes into the appraisal. <laughs> And then the condition of the property. <laughs> so uh, at the most basic, the condition is made up of the foundation, the walls, and the roof, and that's if you have a roof. Um, he or she will be looking at the defects of the general construction of the home and the damage of these components. You do get a final walkthrough before closing um, where you'll have the opportunity to walk through the property and make sure you're getting what you've agreed to pay for. Um, that includes any uh, uh, agreements of repairs, changes, and overall condition before the title is transferred to you. Um, think of it like a mini inspection. And then you want to take a look at utilities before closing. When it comes to, to utilities, you want to prepare uh, with changing the gas, the electric, the water. It is important that those are transferred on the day of closing uh, from the seller's name to the buyer so that the seller is no longer responsible for these uh, costs and utilities. And then the closing. Yay, you made it. Um, so the closing uh, is going to be about 40 minutes typically. Um, any funding conditions are sent to the lender, coordinated by the title company. Um, and then after the closing, um, they'll immediately record that warranty deed and the deed of trust um, and any documents to the county clerk. And then you get the keys. Uh, first things you should do is change the locks. Spares could be floating anywhere. Hide an extra key in a lockbox because thieves will look under flower pots. 
and then reset the codes on your garage and gates. Okay, home sweet home. Um, now you're the owner of a nice new house. Um, and get your pen and paper out because this is really important uh, in the home buying process. It's time to throw a house party and <laughs> <a> house party. <laughs> make sure you're make invite sure we're invited. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much, everybody. Hello, everybody. My name is Ashley Bowen. I am the general curator of the Pueblo Zoo. And if anybody knows me, they know I am a giant fan of red pandas. So let's look at some pretty pictures. Uh, the zoo has actually been a supporter of an organization called Red Panda Network for five years now. And in 2017, a keeper and myself were able to travel to Nepal to help see their uh, conservation work firsthand. So when most people think of Nepal, this is what they picture, the Himalayas. Um, while we did see the Himalayas, or at least the person that took this picture did, my head was under a blanket. Um, <laughs> We were on the eastern side of the country in what is called the Pit Corridor. Um, the Pit Corridor uh, is typically made of very dense forests, uh, which offers excellent camouflage for the red panda, see if you can find it, um, made up primarily of uh, rhododendron magnolia trees with a pretty good understory of bamboo, which is the primary food source of the red panda. Um, now these are considered the foothills, um, and those range anywhere from two to 3,000 meters in elevation. Um, so that's pretty much the height of the Rocky Mountains. Um, this area is actually very biologically diverse. That being said, the pandas are pretty much the only mammal that habitates, habitat, that lives at that elevation, um, contrary to this picture. Um, so there's actually not a lot of natural predators of the red panda in this area of the world. Um, so that means all of the threats to the red panda, unfortunately, are human caused. Um, the, the villages in this part of Nepal are very remote. This is a typical homestead. Um, the two-story building is the living area. The building closest to us is where they make cheese. That first building on the other side of the road is their bathroom. And then past that is the kitchen. Um, most families in this area of the, of the country have to grow all of their own food. It is a several hour trip by car to the next town and most families do not have a car so they have to arrange that ahead of time. Um, and so, like I said, they have to be very self-sufficient. Um, a typical family home uh, has a stove like this one on the left, which is a clay wood burning stove. Uh, that can use up to about 70, 73 pounds of wood a day and um, will actually cause a lot of pollution in the air uh, to the point where um, soot inhalation is a leading cause of premature death of children in the area. So Red Panda Network has actually um, <coughs> created or made a stove more readily available to the families in this area so they no longer have to go out and cut nearly as much timber. Um, and so each village of about 10 people or 10 families are saving about 300 pounds of wood a day. Um, another thing that is causing forest uh, degradation in the area is overgrazing by cattle. Um, Red Panda Network has done a lot of work with this as well and they have created um, transportable shelters for the herders to take into the forest. So the herders no longer have to cut down uh, wood for the shelters. They're also growing their own seedlings so that the farmer, the herders can grow their own food and feed the cattle on site rather than in the forest. The nurseries also provide uh, seedlings to replant the forest um, as well as providing an extra source of income for all of the families. Um, they are also doing pond restorations. So they've done uh, six at this point. This is one of them. Uh, and this offers uh, drinking water for about 40 families, a local school, and all of the uh, natural wildlife in the area. Uh, but most importantly, what Red Panda Network does is they hire uh, local community members to serve as forest <coughs> guardians. And forest guardians, uh, not only do they go out into the forest to monitor red pandas, but they do forest health monitoring. They are in charge of anti-poaching investigations of the area, um, and they serve as nature guides. 
So this is the group that I went with. The forest guardians are serving as our nature guides. And um, these guys are absolutely exceptional at finding the red pandas in the wild. Um, you saw from an earlier slide how well they are hidden. Um, these guys can literally just run up the side of a mountain and find these pandas in the wild. So this was actually on our very first day looking for red pandas. We saw two, uh, dream come true. Um, so Red Panda Network actually understands that conservation programs do not work if the community members are not involved. Um, and with poverty being uh, so prevalent among the communities of this area, um, it is difficult for the locals to make wildlife conservation a priority when they're struggling to feed and warm themselves. Um, the uh, phrase that they commonly use is conservation cannot happen on an empty stomach. So Red Panda Network's mission has been to mitigate red panda habitat loss while enhancing the local livelihoods. And they've actually been seeing a lot of success with that. Um, we're finally able to get accurate counts on how many of these amazing animals are left in the wild. Um, lost my place. Um, and entire villages have actually started ad uh, adapting the new stoves and the new grazing methods. Um, and the every one village we visited, actually every single family in there, in that village, um, was actively engaged in this conservation work. Um, but you can help too. Um, just by visiting the zoo, a portion of your admission goes directly to Red Panda Network. Um, you can go to their website and donate directly, or you can actually go on this trip as well. Um, a lot of people that do it are zoo professionals, but uh, in the group that I was with, um, there was a 60 plus year old woman who I was, like my goal was to keep up with her. <laughs> um, and um, it is, like I said, a once in a lifetime opportunity that I recommend to everybody. Good evening, my name is Bonnie Bowman and I am the president of the Southeast Colorado chapter of NAMI. NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental Wellness and our mission is to support, educate, and advocate for people who suffer from mental illness. We're a national organization and we feel like we represent the consumer experience of the mental health systems in our country. Our view, our view about mental illness is that it's biological. It's also very common. In fact, about 4% of the most seriously of our population have a very serious form of mental illness. It's lethal, the lifespan of a person with a mental illness is several decades less than that for the rest of us. It's highly treatable for most cases, but it's stigmatized. And mental illness is not moral weakness. Mental wellness is not willful bad behavior. It's not poor parenting. And it's not a predictor of violent behavior. And as you'll see, it's unless it remains untreated. Suicide is the most common form of violence in mental illness. Also, people with a mental illness are 12 times more likely to be the victims of a violent crime. And overall, if you look at the statistics, the violence committed by a person with a mental illness contributes very little to the community rate. But there is a reason to talk about violence and mental illness. Because if it's untreated and the person has psychotic paranoia or command hallucinations, they do pose an increased risk of violence. And if you put on top of that substance use, then the risk goes even higher. So why are these ill people going and treated? What happens to them? And what can we, as a community, do about this? First, I need you to understand a symptom that is common to all <coughs> neurological brain disorders and that is anisognosia. Anisognosia is the single largest reason that a person does not get treatment for mental illness. They have no insight into the fact that they are ill, and our society gives them the right to have that lack of insight until they commit a crime. This leads to the title of my talk, which is Stopping the Criminalization of Mental Illness. The premises we're working on is that mental illnesses are treatable, jails are not treatment facilities, and if we leave it untreated, unnecessary and unwanted violence may occur. Every 
time, we are asked to call a policeman for a mental health crisis. Our mental health system has failed us. Officers in Pueblo understand the risks. They have committed to training their officers in crisis intervention techniques. They even have ride-alongs with health solutions. We've done better, and we can do better as a community. In Colorado, there are laws that say when we see a loved one deteriorating and not understanding their illness, we can involuntarily get them into treatment. And the person must show that they are substantially disabled by their mental illness to do this. But unfortunately, there are no civil treatment beds. If I were to go to the court and ask for such a commitment, they wouldn't even take it because we have none and we haven't had any since 2013. The laws also allow for us to have a person involuntary treated in the community. And these are um, laws in which, um, well, I'll show you. Kendra's law, for example. It was the first one. It was in New York State when Kendra Webdale was pushed in front of an oncoming subway train by an untreated person with a mental illness. They discovered that this man was known to be violent when he was off his medication, so they sued the system. And now the New York law says that the judge can order him into to, that he must go to treatment and the treatment provider must treat him. In Colorado, we do not have that last criteria. But in order to offer outpatient and voluntary treatment, we've got to be able to provide the services that they need in the community. And for that, we need assertive community treatment. And these are specialized wraparound services that are proven to reduce um, unwanted outcomes such as jail, they increase housing stability, they lower drug use, but there's no housing. Pueblo really is in a crisis for low-income housing. The occupancy rate is greater than 99%, and as a result, landlords have very little incentive to rent to a person with a known disability. We have no project-based supportive housing. This is housing that's dedicated specifically to people with a mental illness to help them recover. We do have a few tenant-based supportive housing, but a lot of those go unused because nobody will rent to them, even when they have a wraparound service team as a part of that. And I don't want to forget our youth. In uh, Colorado, the age of consent for behavioral health is at 15. Children become ill with a mental illness frequently in their teen years. And so when a person at age 15 denies treatment and can override their, parent, their parents' concern, we have a problem. And these episodes of mental illness are deeply traumatic. In fact, they burn bridges. They involve the criminal justice system, and they increase stigma. And if you increase stigma, recovery chances go way down. No. Nami understands all of this, and we're here for everyone at every level. We have support groups that are peer-led, both family and by people with the illness. We have education programs that have been shown evidence-based and tested throughout the country, and we do presentations by people who have a mental illness to show that recovery is possible. No one asks to be born with a mental illness, and I promise you no family wants mental illness to be a part of their lives. But when mental illness happens, we all want treatment. We do not want jail. And we can move from the shame and blame of our community to one of respect. And I invite you to join us. Thank you. All right, I'm going to do uh, my talk on aquariums today. And are they right for you? Let's find out. Um, some of this is, uh, you could do all of this stuff perfect and it may not turn out just right. So just keep in mind that part of fish aquariums. Um, first up is freshwater aquariums. Um, there's two different types, uh, planted and um, just getting the plastic plants. And I really recommend the um, doing the planted for sure because you get extra oxygen to your fish, and then here's the plastic plants. They're just not as good for the fish, plus you have to clean them. Um, 
if you have something like a beta or something, they might have um, more delicate fins and the plastic plants will totally shred their fins. So, choosing your fish. Um, that one on the right is a tetra. One on the bottom is a gourami. They have two different types of breathing systems. Most fish have gills. Um, the gourami have a labyrinth system. It's the same with betas. Um, it's how you can uh, put a beta in a tank and it doesn't need like a filter and everything. Um, there's different types of substrate. I've had both. Um, there's the pebble and the sand. They say the sand actually catches more like algae and stuff, but from what I noticed, if you put something like a crayfish in there or something, it'll clean the sand and it's actually the other way around. Um, temperament, all sorts of different temperament. Um, aggressive is going to be like a cichlid. Semi-aggressive is like an, a, a garami. Peaceful would be just like a community tank fish. And schooling are things like tetras or like silver dollars that stay in like, they like five or more to feel safe. Um, swimming level, this is more for like aesthetics. Um, you don't want all your fish just at the bottom because it looks lame. So you just try and uh, keep them at all the different levels. Like the catfish and the suckers, they'll stay more at the bottom. And things like that, uh, angelfish and the gouramis are more at the top. Um, for different lightings, um, it's really just more like personal preference, but some fish do like certain colors more than others. So just something to keep in mind, but really it's more for you. Um, but I did have a really bad time with uh, a light and a saltwater tank. Um, tank size, um, general rule is one inch of fish for every gallon of water. Um, with the smaller tanks, um, I tend to keep them like a little less than that even, like a 5 or a 10, but like anything over 100, you can do whatever you want. Water testing kits, um, they, you don't really need to buy them because most of the pet stores around here, you can just take your water and they'll test it while you're cycling your tank, so you really don't need to buy them. Um, just make sure everything's right before you put fish in. Um, flow rate, I have the one on the right, that's a blower. It blows a lot, so my tank's more like a river. One of my tanks anyway. But some things didn't like it, like I had some shrimp and they just kinda, they looked like they were in a tornado until they just disintegrated. Uh, this is what can happen if you put your fish in too early. It's a, uh, a lovely house of death, but uh, it's important to make sure the ammonia is converting to nitrogen, because um, that's exactly what happens. They can't breathe. It's like being in a smoky room and they die. Um, care, um, you're going to want to do water changes on pretty much every type of fish tank. Um, if you have less fish in a larger aquarium, you could probably get away with like once a month, but if you're doing small tank, <coughs> full of fish to the max, you're probably going to have to do it once a week. Um, all sorts of different food, just about everything I'll take the uh, flake food, but um, like on the left, those are blood worms. Um, they're really good for like little crabs and stuff like that. I did have the um, uh, the electricity went out of the house, and they got them frozen. I like them the whole thing on herself. She was really mad. So Try to keep them frozen, I guess. Uh, the differences between uh, the two is obviously salt water tanks have salt in them, so uh, they're more like a sea, uh, like a seascape, and they are much, much more difficult. Um, everything in a salt water tank is pretty much toxic to some degree. The thing on the right is a uh, blood, mm, no. it's a, a worm, but the little uh, hairs on it that you can see there, they're actually uh, like a uh, porcupine quill. So they start working their way into you and you can't get them out and they itch really bad. Um, if you wanna do a saltwater tank, you could do two types of coral rock. Uh, they have live, which is, it has all the like bacteria and stuff from the ocean. Or you can just do dead rock and let it like take to the stuff that you're introducing. 
Um, hard coral versus soft. I had a tank that was all soft coral. The, um, they sent me the wrong light and all my corals died like overnight. So it's really hard to keep. And the, uh, the hard corals are way harder than even those. And then this is just to give you guys an idea of some of the fish have like a symbiotic relationship. Um, the pistol shrimp and the goby, they just hang out together because one digs a hole and the other protects the other one while the other one digs the hole. So uh, they work together. In conclusion, is it right for you? I don't know. You too. <laughs> So I'm Laura Getz, I'm the energy coordinator for Pueblo County. So I'm gonna talk energy. I just wanna make sure you guys know what we have going on in the community right now um, as far as energy is concerned, because there's a lot, there's a lot. Um, <coughs> so did you know that energy is super hot in Pueblo right now? Yeah. This is a picture from an article published uh, by Grist. Um, that featured Pueblo and the renewable energy revolution happening in Pueblo right now. It was followed up by an article in Time Magazine and PRI's The World, among others. Um, and one of the reasons why we're so hot right now is because we have a lot of Sierra Club advocates who got both our city and our county to commit to 100% renewable energy by 2035. <laughs> And I believe we were one of the first 10 communities to do that as well in America. It's fantastic. We are leaders. Um, and another indicator that we are a leader, um, with some help from Excel Energy, uh, you may have heard that they're planning on shutting down Comanche 1 and 2 and replacing it with a massive solar array. And we're talking one of the largest solar arrays in the United States. This is an existing solar array. We're getting one that's five times that size, wow. coupled with battery storage. So this is, we're on the cutting edge here, putting solar and battery storage together, and it's all happening in our backyard, which is pretty fantastic. And there's a workforce development component to this too. So Pueblo Community College is working with some of the developers um, to implement a workforce training program for solar. So if you know anyone who's looking for work in the renewable sector, PCC is soon to be a hub for that. Um, and did you know that we have an energy office in Colorado? We've had it for, or in Pueblo County. We've had it for about a year and a half now. Um, and we'd love for you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook and find out what's going on because we are here to serve you guys and we need to hear from you as well. Um, it's just one person right now, it's just me. But <laughs> we're trying to do a lot. <laughs> did you know that we just installed the first DC fast charging electric vehicle station in the county. And this happened at Pueblo West. Um, and it was a collaboration of a ton of community partners and some grant money from the state. Um, but this is a really big deal for our community. And we're looking at expanding EVG. This is one of nine stations we now have in the library. Um, if you want to learn more, plugshare.com. Um, but we're, we just saw many come online in the last several months. Um, and so if you're an interested business, I'd love to work with you as well um, to help you understand uh, where you could get money to help it, um, to put an EV charging station at your business. We're also a Soul Smart Bronze community. Um, and this is a program that indicates that your community is friendly to solar installations. Um, so we've removed a lot of barriers in Pueblo <coughs> to become a Soul Smart Bronze community. It means we're friendly to solar development. Um, and we're working hard to take down those barriers. We're also one of the sunniest communities in the nation. 99% as much sun as Yuma, uh, which basically means we're the sunniest. <laughs> so we need to make sure we're taking advantage of that incredible resource we have here in Pueblo. Did you know that we have a group called the Renewable Energy Owners Coalition of America? And we have the founders here in the audience. Um, this is a group that is extremely active. They've got hundreds of members at this point, and they work to protect solar owners in our community um, and help you learn how to go solar if, if you're interested or would like to learn more. Uh, they've also just piloted a cool program called Rev to Zev, 
which is taking old vehicles and converting them uh, to electric vehicles. So why go buy a new one when you've got a lot of great shells, <coughs> vehicle shells out there? So they're, it's in the early stages, but they're gathering a ton of cool community partners. So make sure you ask them if you're interested. <coughs> Did you know that insulation um, is the number one thing to, to tackle in the house to make your home more efficient and more comfortable? Yeah, I'm taking a tangent here. <laughs> if you don't know, most people think it's windows, but it's actually insulation. So if you don't know how much insulation you have, we've got programs for you. So if you're low income, we'll do a lot of that work for free with our weatherization program or with Energy Outreach Colorado. Um, if you don't meet that income qualification, um, Black Hills Energy and San Isabel also have some great programs. Um, and we can hook you up with those programs. Did you know that our library now has a kilowatt meter checkout program? So you can check this out from any branch in your library district and plug it in, plug in your appliances to see just how much money they're costing you and how much energy they're using. So you can take control of your energy. <laughs> Did you know there's a, a new cool program for commercial buildings that allows you to do some fantastic major renovations to buildings? Um, that will save the building owner a ton of money, um, upgrade the property, and require zero money down. This is, this is a new thing, cutting edge. Um, but if you know anyone who's interested, I want to work with them. Did you know we're going to start benchmarking our buildings like cities around the nation have started doing? Um, we're going to help uh, our commercial buildings understand their energy use intensity and connect them with the resources that can help them bring their energy use and their bills down. So. This is, this is coming online, stay tuned. And we're also in the midst of doing an energy master plan for our community. And so again, early stages, but we're going to need lots of community input. So be on the lookout um, for opportunities to give your input and find out uh, what we're gonna be doing energy-wise in our community. We absolutely need to hear from you. And so finally, I want you to contact me. I wanna talk to you about all things energy. I'll talk to you about other things too. <laughs> I am your resource, I'm here for you, and I would love to hear from you and talk to you um, and answer any questions, solve any problems you have. So just know I'm here. Thank you so much for your time. Alright, so today uh, I'm talking to you about my business, TikTok Pueblo, and our position as a third place in Pueblo. Uh, third places are places that are not home and they're not work, they're places we live, places we socialize. They're meant to be equalizers. Uh, they are meant to be places where people can come and interact with other members of their community. Starbucks has long tried to position themselves as a third place. Uh, but as we know from recent, let's call them kerfuffles, uh, if you don't look white enough, if you don't look rich enough, uh, that might not apply to you. You might not be able to access these kind of third places. So this wasn't working for me. Where I was is I was in academia. This is my small child. And uh, I called him the littlest postgrad. Look at him. <laughs> but this was terrible. I hated working there. 80 hours a week. He was in my office with me all the time. We didn't see the sun ever. It was terrible. So I thought, okay, we have to get out of this. We have to do something more community minded. And so here we are moving into TikTok. Look at that kid. He's outside. <laughs> He's enjoying the process. Art takes time that says Monet grew his gardens before he planted them. And we have been growing our garden. Uh, we are working really hard on getting people to understand what we are. And what we are is a pay per minute space. We are a beautiful space. Uh, as you can see from the left versus the right, a beautiful space by itself is just nice. What gives it its soul, what animates it, is when we have people. When we have these large groups, these small groups, these people coming in and interacting, this is where we get this wonderful community. So, contrast the kid earlier. Now he's playing games with other children. He's learning to interact with all sorts of different people that he wouldn't have seen in academia. Uh, you know, we have all sorts of things for people. We have games, we have books, we have yelling into a microphone. We have things for people to come in and do. And third places are shaped by their regulars, partially. And so here are two of our regulars pretending to be dead on some of our couches, because they're dramatic. Uh, here are some of our folks who are uh, doing an art class. We offer art classes. 
the different things that we offer change all the time because people come in and they go, hey, have you, have you tried doing this? And we know, let's do it. So over here, uh, we had a felting class because somebody wanted to teach people how to do needle felting. If you haven't done that, you get to stab things a lot. <laughs> and then at the end of that, we have cute narwhals. So usually you don't get to stab things and get narwhals. Uh, and so we are working hard on making a community space that's accessible to everyone who wants to be there. Young, old, rich, poor. The ask per person is very low. It works out to 480 an hour. Uh, but if, if you can't afford that, we have the gift of time. So people round up and they give their own gift of time and we can use that for people. And that's for everybody. And in line with that, we have things like our knit-a-thon that we did in December. Somebody donated a bunch of yarn to us, and went, what are we going to do with this? Okay, guess we're going to make a bunch of hats. That's a very small portion of the hats and scarves we ended up making. People came in, and they gave money to Posada. They made hats. They made scarves, and we donated them. And so <laughs> we make these spaces um, for everyone. And so uh, the Arts Alliance has a teen group, Youth Impact, it's the Impact Youth Initiative. And they've taken us over a few times for First Friday. Here they are confronting a local politician. Uh, and they, man, they were working them hard. They were like, why aren't you doing enough for young people in this town? And you know, it's an actively political space. And so this is our little, that's my favorite mug in the world. Um, and that really sums us up. Uh, it's weird, it's aggressive, and uh, it's savage, not average. And uh, if anyone knows where to find that mug, please let me know. Uh, but we are, a political space. You don't have to agree with us on our exact politics, but we're political. And so part of that is the neoliberalization of work and how it sucks. Uh, this is one of my staff's children. Uh, he comes in with her to work every single day because we are a family friendly space. That's my child in a dinosaur suit. <laughs> Guys, that happens regularly. You should come in. Uh, but you can come in. You can be by yourself. You can be like my friend Chad there breaking the rules and sitting where you're not supposed to sit. But you come in, you use the space how you want to use the space. It's constantly evolving. You know, uh, whether you want to be with people, you want to meet new people, you want to shut up and read The Hobbit and not talk to anyone, this is what we do here. And so, other things we do is music. So we have a whole range of music from an 11-year-old guitarist, this excellent duo, the CSU Pueblo Flute Choir. We always have different people coming in and trying to explore new ways of expression new ways of building community. And that was from our very first person who came in, uh, who, right here, she's it's a poor picture, but that's the space lady. She'll be back in March, we're really excited. Um, but she's our ethos, she's very much, she's herself no matter what, and that is what we want to be. And so we have our different socializing groups, our different networking groups. Uh, our monthly networking has been moved to Walters this month, and I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, but we have these different groups that come in. We have people coming and have parties. We have people learning new skills, sharing their skills with others. And we really, this is the kind of way we change the way our communities get together. Uh, because everyone here knows we get isolated in our little pockets of town. Yeah? And this changes it up. So now we have my little weirdo again. And it's in a very different environment than academia. In January, we were truffle shuffling into the new year like a boss. And uh, we're really getting into the swing of things, because we're still pretty new. And then, on the 20th of January, next door lit on fire. This is a picture of my sandwich board from two days before that was up. The firefighters did not stop laughing at me, <laughs> because apparently I possess the gift of prophecy. Uh, it's not good. So we've been closed since January 20th. We should be open for Valentine's Day, which is nice. I'm very excited. Um, but our wonderful community has stepped up. There's some people in the audience in these pictures. People are volunteering their time. People are offering services. Over on the right, that is the back room of Walters. Uh, because the owners stepped up and went, hey, we know you have those classes and know where to give them, so here you go. Uh, and speaking of Walters, our Creatives Networking Group is tomorrow at 3. Thank you. Thank you.